So welcome, welcome everybody. My name is Bartek Lipinski and I am an Android software engineer at Fabulous. And today I will be talking to you about generating Kotlin extension functions and especially doing that for the purposes of, an of annotation processing. If anyone wants to follow along with the presentation, slides should be available up there, so you can go there. Uh, before I begin, by a quick show of hands, how many of you have ever tried using annotation processors? Okay, and anyone ever tried writing one? Awesome. Okay, so I will do a quick, super quick introduction to annotation processing, like to annotation processors, um, just for the rest of you guys, right? So most annotation processing libraries have two components, at least two components. Something super lightweight, annotations component, and something much heavier, a, a compiler component. The compiler is something that its, its main job is to search through the code, through the written code, or generated code as well as actually, for annotations and do something with them. It can do many things, but the most in interesting, at least for me, thing is code generation. So in terms of, of code generation, you have to remember about a few things. First of all, you have to remember that annotation processors cannot modify existing code. They can only generate new code. And this is something that you have to understand quite quickly if you try to write annotation, pro annotation processors because this means that you have to completely change the way you think about code generation. The second thing is that compilers generate code in compile time. And that's very important because when you're writing your code, the code that will be generated will be available later on in the process when your code, your written code, is actually compiled as well. And the third thing, may, maybe very obvious and kind of redundant, is the fact that the generated code is unknown until it's actually generated. So th those are the th three things that you have to remember. That you can only generate new code, that it's unknown until it's actually generated, and it, that it will be generated in compile time. And from the perspective of your code, this raises two questions of what will be generated, what code will be generated, and when will it be generated. Those three things result in one simple conclusion. It's very difficult to refer or to use, to uh, do anything with the generated code that is the result of the compiler. And this is something that many developers try to tackle. This problem was uh, was very difficult for ev for a lot of developers. And I was looking through many libraries and I, I saw that actually there were mostly two approaches that people were taking. First of all, is something that I like to call the I don't care approach. And se second, something I like to call the reflection bridge approach. Let's talk about the I don't care approach first. Um, how many of you have ever used a library called Dagger? Awesome. So for the rest of you, or maybe for both of you, I guess, uh, this is a, that's, a, that's a dependency injection framework. And it actually generates a lot of code. If you look through the generated code from Dagger, it, there's a lot of it. And the important thing is that, in general, there's one entry point to the generated code. So you can access, you can use the generated code through one entry point, one, one access point. And it's the class that implements your component. And Dagger expects you to use something like this, this pattern that you use your component class name prefix with the word Dagger. Okay, so from, from you who used the Dagger, how many of you see, have seen something similar to this? <laughs> okay, and most, most importantly, this and this, right? So that your IDE cannot resolve the Dagger app component. The Dagger the app component prefix with the word dagger class. That's something quite familiar probably to many of you because of the exact reason that dagger developers maybe didn't care or maybe couldn't come up with a better solution. I don't know. I don't want to like say anything bad about dagger. Don't get me wrong. I love this library. But the fact that you need to refer to the class that will be available later in the process is something a bit inelegant to say the least. So to summarize, I don't care approach is something 
easy to implement. That's a big advantage, but it's easy to implement for the developer of the library, not for the user of the library. Apart from that, I'd say it's pretty, it's just not straightforward. If you think about that, just let's do a, this quick thought experiment. Imagine that you don't know anything about Dagger. You, you just don't know this library at all. And I will hand you over this library and try to figure it out without any documentation. Do you think you would be able to figure out that you have to use the Dagger class, the app component class, without a prefix with the word Dagger? I would have the hard, hard time for sure. Because this approach strongly depends on documentation. There's the need for, for the developer of the library to give you some documentation on how you should be using the generated code. And it puts the responsibility of the proper usage of the library on the user and not on the developer. Because if you make a typo in the Dagger app component or whatever name of the class, your code will not work. It's your responsibility to type it correctly. The second approach, the reflection bridge, is actually something quite sophisticated. And, and I, when, I, when I analyzed it first, I was actually quite, um, quite surprised. And I liked it very much. Because this introduces a second component, a runtime library, something that you can include in your code and don't worry about it being too heavy. And it has something that I call the reflection bridge. And this little component knows something about how the compiler works. And having this knowledge, it can actually find generated code in runtime. But the one small problem with this solution is that it uses Java reflection. And probably, as most of you know, it has some dra dra performance drawbacks. Uh, so how many of you guys are Android developers? Do you know Butterknife? Awesome. Very good. So Butterknife, just a qu quick introduction, is a library that reduces boilerplate, Android boilerplate, referring views, resources, etc. It generates classes with view binding suffix. And they are available through a set of methods, a set of bind methods. And if you think about the reflection bridge in this library, it can find the code with a few, uh, with some knowledge about the compiler. First of all, it knows that the compiler will generate classes with this pattern in the name. It knows where those classes will be generated. And it knows the API of classes in a form of an interface. Having this knowledge, it can find generated classes. It can create instances of those classes. And also, it can return those instances in a form of the unbinder interface, just like that. And this approach is actually pretty straightforward. If I handed you over this class, you probably would be able to figure, uh, figure out how to use it. Also, it puts the responsibility of the proper usage on the developer of the library and not on the user. The one drawback is that it uses Java reflection. So those were the two approaches that are currently available. But I would like to propose the third one, the extension bridge approach. It's actually, from the first sight, it actually looks quite similar to the reflection bridge approach. Because also, it has some, some library, some library, uh, runtime library. But the fact is that it does not use reflection bridge. It uses something that I call the end cap of the extension bridge. Why the end cap? Well, because it just pretends to be the real thing. It is just something that you ref can refer to right after you uh, include the library in your project. But it's not the real thing. The real thing actually will be compiled, generated side by side with the generated code. And this will be something that will attach to the library for your usage. And this will be the component that actually knows how compiler works. And this way, this whole setup will be able to find the generated code in runtime. And having this pretender here, you will be able to refer to the uh, generated code right after you include the library in your project. And the best thing of all, it doesn't use Java reflection with a small asterisk. So why did I even call it extension bridge? Well, quite obviously, because of Kotlin extension functions, right? So why Kotlin extension functions? Because they 
seemingly add behavior to existing classes without modify, modifying them. And this seemingly is actually perfectly fine with us. We just can pretend that this, uh, this adds, adds some behavior. And if you remember from one of the first slides, annotation processors cannot modify existing code. They can only generate new code. So if we are not modifying code, but we are making it look like we are modifying it, it's super cool for us. Everybody familiar with Kotlin extension functions? Okay, some, f some faces weren't so sure. So I'm gonna do a super quick tutorial. Imagine that you are a cook in a dumplings restaurant and your management says that you can boil them, bake them, fry them and serve them, but you cannot eat them. So you create an extension function with a receiver type of dumplings that you can eat. And uh, uh, the receiver type will be, some, with, with, will be the thing on which you will be able to call this method. So now, not, not only you can prepare those dumplings, you can boil and serve them, but you can also eat them. So uh, to prove this uh, approach works, I created two proof of concept libraries for the two uh, libraries that I was mentioning before. So for butter knife and later on for the dagger. First of all, let's see how it works. You've got the end cap, so this thing pre pretends to be the real thing. And this is shipped as a library, so you can refer to it right after you include it in your project. No, no, no need for compiling. You've got one extension function with uh, something artificial, but let's talk about this later, and that has just ju that just throws an exception, which might be not the best idea, but I will tell tell some more about it later. And you've got a very non-specific target method. So you've got this extension function with um, not very non-specific parameters, sorry, of the function. And you've got second extension function, which is generated on demand, that has a much more specific target function, a target parameter. And if you look at this setup, and if you use this method and pass the main activity as, an, as a parameter, the Kotlin compiler will look at those two methods and it will choose the one that fits better. And this will be the one that fits better if you, if you pass main activity. And if you look at the implementation of those met two methods, this is the real thing. This knows about the compiler. This knows about the name of the, of, of the generated class. It knows how to create it in return as, a, as an unbinder interface. And this whole, this whole setup is actually based on this end cap. So this is the, the, the runtime library that you can include. This, uh, this, this is the stub implementation. Just few methods with the singleton, artificial singleton, that is used as, a, as the um, receiver type of extension functions. Why this kind of setup? Because I wanted to maintain, maintain pretty similar structure to what the butter knife does originally. So you would normally call butter knife bind, butter knife bind this, and here you just do it like this. Butter knife KTX bind this, and everything works the same. But you are not using Java reflection. So maybe let's try to do a super simple demo, okay? Can you see the code? Okay, I will try to do this. It will not be easy. Let's try to clean the project first. So you are, sh you are sure that there's nothing generated. You've got a um, simple demo activity with a, sim with a single uh, butter knife binding and there's butter knife KTX bind method. If I uh, click on it and see what it l leads to, you will see that it leads to the throw illegal state exception method, right? So the stub implementation. But if I go back and rebuild the project, and hopefully it won't take long, will it? If this goes bad, bad, this is my last demo. <coughs> now we can see that if I click on the method once again, you can see that now it leads to the to the proper uh, mm, proper implementation of the extension function. 
Okay. That's it. For the <laughs> and I created something very similar for the dagger. So uh, again, you've got like the stub implementation that just throw an exception, an artificial, uh, artificial singleton object that is shipped as a library, so you can refer to it right after you include it in your project. And you've got second extension function that has a much more uh, specialized parameter, and this returns the dagger app component class of which I was speaking about earlier. And this is generated on demand. So you no longer have to call dagger app component dot create, which will probably not compile on the first run, but you can cr use this, which will cr cr uh, compile on the first run. So how do you do it? It's how do you do it? You use Kotlin Poet. I will not go into ma much details in terms of how you should implement that because that really depends on your case. It's something quite uh, specific to your particular library. But having this small example would be nice. So uh, this is the, uh, the specification of the function uh, that I used f inside the Butterknife KTX library. And you can see that just the function with the receiver type. And this will generate an extension function. So to summarize, the extension bridge approach is something that is actually quite straightforward. It also puts the responsibility on the developer of the library, not on the user. But the most importantly, it does not depend on Java reflection. So those are like the advantages of reflection bridge approach without the disadvantage of it. So maybe let's try to do some more demos. I've got two more prepared for you, so you can see why I put this little asterisk uh, just by the Java, refl Java reflection thing. First of all, something that is called static resolution. Because you have to remember that extension functions are static res resolved, and this, that's a very important thing. Because if you look at the at the similar example that I uh, showed you before, but this one uh, is specifying the argument explicitly. So this is us using the static resolution activity, this one, and it's passing this particular type as an argument of the bind method. So let's see what it leads to. Okay, so that's that was expected. It leads to the um, proper implementation of the extension function. But if you go lower and you see that here I casted um, this static resolution activity to the parent class, which is just activity, and Kotlin compiler looks looks through the uh, extension function and sees uh, that the argument of the extension function is actually activity, and it does not resolve the, car the actual type of the of this uh, of this parameter, it will see that the bind method leads to the end cap. So it's not ideal because we passed it. We passed the correct thing. We had correctly generated the other extension function, but it still uh, showed us the uh, the stub implementation. So that's one thing. And another thing is Java interoperability, because I'm not sure if you know, but you can call extension functions from Java. The problem with those is that. Uh, extension functions from Kotlin are seen by Java as a static method with another parameter. So the first parameter is the receiver type. So if you look at Butterknife KTX KT, you can see there are f few static methods, and the first argument of all those methods is the receiver type. So let's use one of them. Let's pass the singleton object. That's the problem. Of yeah. But, but, but. Oh, here it is. This should be working. And more so, you can actually see in the generated code that the proper extension function was generated. But if you look what Java does with this, 
you can see that the bind method still leads to the stub implementation. And if you know more than me about this, I've got only assumptions of why this is not working. Uh, I guess the, the thing that performs the extension function resolution is the Kotlin compiler. Uh, the Kotlin compiler itself is not taking part in, in compiling this Java file, J Java file. So this just leads to the, to the one extension function that we had before. And it does not consider the one that will be generated later on. If, if you know more than, me, more than me about that, tell me. So how can we overcome this? We can use something that I call the hybrid extension bridge. So this thing works the same. But we put some Java reflection inside the end cap, the stub implementation. This way, when something forces us to actually use this end cap, we just have a fallback solution that will find the generated code in runtime with a performance drawback of Java reflection. And to make it work, it's actually very simple. Because you simply change this extension function that was, uh, uh, that is the stub implementation, you change the throw illegal exception to the original butter knife reflection based approach. And that's it. And I would like to thank you very much. That will be all. If you have any questions, please tell me. <laughs> so, any questions? Uh, I want to free. Okay, thank you for your presentation. It was very technical, very interesting. Uh, as we know, uh, as Android developers, similar things like um, red highlight things uh, sometimes happen with data binding. Do you think there is any possibility to use a similar approach uh, with data binding framework and to improve it somehow? I know it's. So the question is more can complex. we use the extension bridge approach? in the data binding library of Android, right? Basically, basically, basically yes. Um, I don't think there is, because the data binding library involves compiling and analyzing XML files. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if you can do that easily with the solutions that are available for us right now as those library uh, developers. So I think not, at all. Not, not right now, or maybe I cannot come with uh, any of those for now. Cool. Any more questions? No? It's okay. So thank you very much for your patience with me. Thank you.